customer of American industry is the well-paid worker. Our aim must be to achieve and maintain a national economy whose factors are so finely balanced that the worker is always sure of a job which will guarantee a living wage. Labor unions uphold the rights of many Americans, both union and non-union alike. What many don't realize is that an affront to our labor unions is an attack on American workers' rights and our democracy. The union movement is, first of all, a democratic movement. It's a movement which brings democracy to the workplace. Instead of saying, oh yes, the owner of that private property is an autocrat and his will is, is, is law, it says, no, we're all involved in this uh, enterprise, if you will, together, and there are certain rights that ought to adhere in the people who work there. Historically, unions have represented the political voice of the otherwise disenfranchised worker, the middle and working class, people of color, and women. Uh, the labor movement was in the vanguard not only of, uh, of uh, industrial democracy, but for such things as social security and unemployment insurance and minimum wage legislation. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. Not only to organize industrial workers and bring some modicum of industrial democracy to the workplace, but also to bring social justice more generally. The benefits they've won have changed the shape of American society for the better. Eight-hour workdays, weekends, worker safety initiatives, living wages. These are what unions have fought for and won and what every American benefits from. In fact, we may take the eight-hour day for granted today, but actually millions of employers no longer enjoy the eight-hour day. They once did when the union movement was strong. In America today, what we are seeing is the richest people becoming richer and almost everybody else becoming poorer. Yeah. And what we are saying is enough is enough. enough. People are beginning to see that this kind of what is called neoliberal capitalism has a very strong family resemblance to the Darwinian capitalism our ancestors had to live under, and they've had enough of that and want a real change in the system. Our nation's unions are under threat from all three branches of the federal government. The president is weakening the National Labor Review Board. President Trump should be familiar with the NLRB, as his own businesses have had complaints filed numerous times. That is precisely why it is so important that the board is independent. And Congress is threatening to pass a national right to work bill that would devastate unionization efforts nationwide. All that right to work means is that when you have a union contract in place, that contract cannot provide that everybody who is represented by the union must either join or pay a fee to the union. Right now the Supreme Court is likely to uphold a lower court's decision that will allow non-union members to benefit from collective bargaining without paying dues or fees. A cut to unions' income would debilitate their ability to exist and serve the workers of our country. Well, the biggest threat is Janus, number one, and it's going to happen. Um, there's, but Janus is... is um, there was a case that was pending before the Supreme Court before Justice Scalia died. Um, that would have basically implemented right to work um, in the public sector. There are still battles to be waged. We have to work on the state and local level to ensure that right to work efforts are beaten back in our state legislatures. States like Missouri, where right to work legislation is passed, have referenda coming to a vote in 2018 that can undo that damage. We must support our brothers and sisters in their efforts. Remember that the people who benefit from unionization efforts are the workers. The fight here is against corporations that want to weaken the rights of their own employees. So when you get to the Great Depression of the 1930s, what you're looking at is most of basic industries, steel and rubber and auto, most of these basic industries are unorganized. But in the 1930s, all of that changed. It changed for two reasons, both because 
uh, groups of very militant workers organized on the shop floor and won the, and some of these were left-wing organizers, members of the Communist Party or the Socialist Party or other left-wing organizations, determined to organize at the grassroots. And they built very powerful and very resilient movements in places like the auto industry, for example. They were able to engage in some of the most stunning uh, strikes in American history. And these sit-down strikes that began in Flint spread all over the country. The other reason the union movement succeeds is because the New Deal administration, the Roosevelt administration, in order to sustain itself as a powerful political force in the country, began to either be neutral towards the labor movement, which previous presidents had not been, or even in some cases to side with uh, the union movement. And Roosevelt, with some reluctance, backed the Wagner Act, the, the, which is the National Labor Relations Act, which gave workers the right, for the first time in American history, to engage in collective bargaining and compelled employers to negotiate with them. By assuring the employees the right of collective bargaining, it fosters the development of the employment contract on a sound and equitable basis. It seeks for every worker within its scope that freedom of choice and action which is justly his. So all of this happens in the 1930s and it changes the face of the country. For the first time, the government took the responsibility at the urging of this mass labor movement to guarantee a certain level of social welfare. We would not be talking about a welfare system today, aid to uh, 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 dependent children and, and other forms of welfare legislation, had it not been for the labor movement of the 1930s and 40s. It's not just the union worker that benefits. It's all workers. If we allow our unions to be dismantled, we won't be able to stand up to employers who are taking more and more rights away from workers every day. It's a very precarious situation for many people. Yeah. And, and that might have been true in, in 1880. It was no longer true in 1950, and now it's true again. The worker by himself is powerless to come up against the power of his employer. Only collectively can he exercise, and therefore democratically, can he civilize and democratize the workplace. To quote a, a, a famous labor organizer of the early 20th century, Joe Hill, don't mourn organizing. We'll stand as one or fail. Keep your hand upon the dollar. 